Hey everybody, Dr. G here. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and body language expert, and today we're going to be analyzing the case of the Delphi murders. The Delphi murders happened on February 13th, 2017. Abigail Williams, who was 13 years old, and Libby German, who was 14 years old, were brutally murdered in the woods. Richard Allen has been arrested and charged with both murders. His defense claims that one person could not have acted alone and committed the murders. Additionally, they claim that the murders were ritualistic and that a local Odinist group, in fact, is the one who committed a ritual sacrifice. I'm going to explain today why both of those claims are nonsense. In addition to that, we're going to take a brief look at his body language. But before we get started with that, I wanted to let you know that this is not any sort of formal psychological evaluation. I'm just giving my opinions based on publicly available information. Additionally, I'm not trying to speak on the guilt nor the innocence of Richard Allen. Last thing before we get started is that I do want to remind you to like and subscribe if you want to see more content just like this. All right, let's go. The way that I'm approaching this information is with my counterterrorism background. I was involved for a couple of years in a counterterrorism program run by current and former U.S. intelligence. One of the big focuses in that program was domestic terrorism. So I know a lot about extremist groups in addition to my background in psychology. So I'm using that perspective to analyze this information because it's very much relevant to the claims that are being made. Now we're going to look at a brief video that was caught on Libby's phone. People oftentimes refer to him as Bridge Guy. It is presumed that this is in fact the man who killed them. Let's see if there's anything that the body language of the man on the bridge can tell us. As you can see here, he takes fairly small strides. His back is hunched over a little bit. You can see he walks with his arms back. And this is a very distinct posture. It's not that there's not multiple people that do this, but this is a distinct way of walking. You can tell his back is hunched over a little bit because of the way that his head is pushed forward, right? Because if you see somebody stand upright, it looks quite different. Now, part of that could be that he's trying to hide. I talk oftentimes about how we take on body postures that are meant to make us smaller. And so keeping his hands in his pockets, not moving his arms, keeping his head forward a little bit, that could be his natural gait, or it could be him trying not to seem suspicious. Look how slowly and calmly he's walking. I genuinely do not believe this is the first time that this individual has committed murder. What we're going to do is we're going to watch a little bit of Richard Allen walking, the limited amount of footage we have of that, and we'll compare the two. Now we're going to watch Richard Allen being escorted to a hearing. I want us to get an idea of what his body posture is like as he does this. Now, what we're seeing here is we're seeing somebody that's a bit hunched over, right? Like he leans forward, his chin is down, fairly similar to what we saw at, from the man on the bridge. Now, I want you to keep in mind, what we can't do is say the guy on the bridge and Richard Allen are definitely the same person because they walk the same. But what we can do is we can say that there is some similarity. If he looks totally different, then you might say, okay, this doesn't match up at all. And what we're seeing so far is some pretty similar body posture. Let's go back and watch this again. I'm putting this up so you can watch them both walk at the same time and form your own opinions based on what you're observing. Now we're going to talk about the psychology and the behavior of a couple of the points made by the defense. First, the idea that it had to have been more than one person, which I find utterly ridiculous. This one, I think, is frankly offensive to Libby and Abigail, because really they're suggesting that there's no way that if he was attacking one person, that the other person would have stayed, that they would have run away, that it would require more than one person. And that is simply not true. One is if you look at the freeze response. When we think about fight or flight, it's really freeze, flight, and fight. The first thing that we do is freeze. We freeze and we try to hide. This is something that many people get stuck in, whether it's during attacks, assaults. There's all sorts of ways that people get stuck in freeze. And I don't like it when people use the argument that somebody should have run away because I really don't think that they can fully appreciate just how impossible it is to run when freeze, flight, or fight is activated. Some people truly are stuck in freeze. The shock and the disbelief of what is happening. Compliance under threat is another one. It's reported that he had a gun. And if he had a gun, even if for your own well-being that running away would have been a possible way to escape, it's a ludicrous idea that somebody with a gun couldn't make people comply. The age of Abby and Libby. You have to keep in mind how young they were. And when you have an adult with a gun, 
that is telling them God knows what or making threats that we don't even know. The idea that it would take two people to do that is preposterous. Truly it is. So frankly, I think suggesting that is blaming the victims, suggesting, well, one person couldn't have done that. I think that is an insult to the memory of these girls to truly suggest that that's the case. Social compliance can be another one. When someone orders you to do something, it can be hard to resist or to say no or to know what to do, particularly if they have a gun. The amount of overwhelmed confusion. These girls are not equipped to think like this or to know what to do in those situations. When things are happening, the level of shock that is going on is hard to describe how anybody would actually react in these situations. People would like to think, oh, yeah, I would have just gotten up and run away. So think about it like this. There's a predator and there are two victims. You think one of those victims would want to leave the other one alone? If they're making threats, hey, you leave, I'm going to do this. Whatever it is that was being said at that time, the psychological control that can happen in that kind of situation is beyond what I think most people can truly comprehend. Now, does that mean it wasn't more than one person? Obviously not. Obviously, it could have been more than one person. But the suggestion that it had to be more than one person is utterly ridiculous and works against the tenets of psychology, trauma, and fear as we know it. I really genuinely do not believe that it would require more than one person to do exactly what happened. So now we're going to take some time to talk about the ritual aspect of this and why that argument doesn't really make any sense. One is the idea that sticks were laid on the bodies in some sort of runic formation that was somehow meaningful. Another is that there was an F or something that appeared to be like an F that maybe was a rune drawn on a tree. It's also claimed that the position of the one, one of the bodies is similar to, but not exactly like, art known in the pagan world. So let's go through point by point, and I'm going to explain why the logic of this doesn't really make any sense. Let's take a minute to talk about complex rituals versus criminal acts. Okay, so they're claiming that there is this big, elaborate, complex ritual and we're going to explain why that really doesn't make sense. But the criminal side of things. So they're suggesting that white nationalists, this has taken over this Odinist group, or they're using that ideology. Typically for extremist groups, they use hate speech, they use propaganda, and they engage in acts of terror sometimes in the really extreme forms. The sacrifice or the claimed sacrifice or ritual does not meet any of those. It makes no sense in that ideology. None whatsoever. But what the defense is doing is they're presenting ideas about Odinism and all of this because nobody really knows much about it. I didn't know much about it before I started researching it. I know a lot about extremist groups. I could talk about them all day, but Odinism, paganism, and all that stuff, it took a lot of research, but I was able to pretty easily debunk all of this, which we'll get to. But as far as the ideology of the extremist goes, it doesn't hold water. It doesn't make sense. And there's no purpose that they would murder two adolescent Caucasian girls because that doesn't serve any ideological purpose. So let's talk about the alleged rune that was on the tree. So there was blood on the tree that was in a marking something like this, or at least it was alleged to be something like this shape. This does look similar to the letter F. It also looks similar to a specific rune, that rune meaning wealth or cattle, apparently. It's not one that's used in sacrifices. It's not one that's used in rituals, and it's not one that's used related to things Odin. This doesn't make any sense. So, okay, does it look rune-ish? A lot of things look rune-ish. It's just different angles and a couple of different lines crossed together. You can do that with pretty much anything. But in the context of a ritual, it makes no sense. I want you to be thinking about this as I talk about the ritual side of things. If these were people that were so serious about a ritual that they were literally willing to murder two people for the ritual, do you not think that they would actually get the ritual parts of it right? Do you not think that they would be engaging in something that's consistent, that's been done before? Because everything that's been described has never been seen before. These are not things that are done. Now let's talk about the sticks that were allegedly shaped into runes on top of the bodies. From what's described by the defense, the sticks are laying in a pattern, something like this. The problem is, is that once again, this is not part of a ritual. This doesn't really make any sense. There's no reason why you would have the sticks laying on the bodies. That's not something that's done by pagans or Odinists or anybody. So it's not like this is consistent with any sort of ritual. And once again, you're going to tell me that somebody is going to sacrifice a human and then just make up the rest of the ritual on their own and do something nobody's ever seen before? That doesn't make any sense. Extremist Odinists are not known for acting these kinds of rituals out or having sort of a ritual gone bad. It doesn't make sense with everything that we know about the far extremist versions of Odinists. It just doesn't add up and is not consistent with behavior, with known behavior of Odinists. The ritual elements, 
There were no known ritual elements incorporated into this from what I can tell. And so the idea that it's people just haphazardly doing things in the woods and sacrificing people doesn't hold water. It doesn't make sense. The date, February 13th, holds no significance. I looked if the date overlaps with any sort of holidays. It doesn't. There's nothing special about that day. So why would such a significant sacrifice be done on that day if these were people that actually believed in this? Multiple people going along with this. Here's another problem. Let's just say for argument, you said, okay, fine. This wasn't somebody who was actually an Odinist, but maybe they'd been Googling it and were thinking about it, and then they put all this haphazard stuff together, and this is somebody who's just completely lost their mind. Okay, fine. So you're going to tell me that this is a group, though, and that this is part of a bigger thing, and that other people are not only willing to go along with this, but they're okay with it? Like I said, I know a lot about extremist groups. I don't know much about Odinism other than what I've studied for the past couple of days, but the idea that this somehow represents either Odinists which it really doesn't seem to, or extremists, which also doesn't really make any sense, just doesn't hold any water. And from what I've read, it sounds like they're also throwing in the idea that there are different people who work in the prison system or something like that that wear these runes on their badge and all of this stuff. Now we're coming to the idea of conspiracy, and that's where it starts to get even more ludicrous. And so part of what being able to develop conspiracies is is it's being able to make meaning out of things that don't mean anything able to find coincidences or something that we project our own thoughts and beliefs and feelings onto, leaving identifying evidence behind. Think about it like this. Let's say that this really was some sort of perverse, bizarre person who decided to commit some sort of ritual and sacrifice where they really don't have to leave runes around because from my understanding, that's not really a thing typically. They're going to leave things that identify their ideology and who they're connected with. That doesn't make any sense. Why would they do that? Because this isn't a known part of performing those kinds of rituals from what I've read. So why would you do that? Why would you leave evidence behind that, that helps people identify who you are when it's not a necessary part of what you're doing? It doesn't make any sense. So this argument preys on people's fears. The idea that there are people committing human sacrifice is obviously a very scary concept. So when they're talking about something that people don't know anything about, oftentimes we do react with fear. I think this is smart on the part of the defense in the sense that for some people, they might find this really scary. I personally find it ridiculous. And I think that the idea that this is how they're deciding to frame things is problematic because I don't think that this holds water. And I don't know if a jury would be convinced by an argument like this. I am certainly not because to me, this all seems like projection, like coincidence. And there's nothing about this that logically makes any sense. So the suggestion of Odinism preys on the idea that most of us don't know anything about it, which is true. I think the vast majority of us know little to nothing about Odinism. I know a lot about white supremacist groups. I know a lot about extremist groups. They don't really engage in these kind of practices either. They may do acts of terror sometimes, but not just randomly. And they don't just randomly commit murder and then identify who they are. This doesn't make any sense. People like that were going to identify who they were. It would be, once again, preying on someone vulnerable, some sort of warning to minorities or to society or something like that. There was no message here. This was just murdering two girls. I think likely what we're dealing with is a sexual sadist and a psychopath, someone who's murdered before. Whoever Bridge Guy is, he seemed pretty calm. And if he knew he was going to murder somebody and he had that level of calm, I would be absolutely shocked if he hasn't done it before. So I hope this analysis is helping you get a better idea of the psychology behind all of this. I know it's complicated. I know it's confusing, but hopefully it's giving you a better understanding. And before we wrap things up, I do want to let you know that I always read the comments and I would love for you to give me more suggestions. I'm always looking for new cases to analyze. Last thing before we get finished up is I do want to remind you to like and subscribe if you want to see more content just like this. All right. Thanks for watching.